And so that extreme ambition and my exposure to the entertainment industry and proximity to the scene, you know, it was perfect for someone who had like a Messiah complex. And I was already making fun of the Messiah complex. It was just so meta on so many levels. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, if you want to support the podcast, you can just go over to patreon.com slash thiswasthescene, and you can sign up for a buck a month. Or you can donate one time by going to This Was The Scene, and right in the top of the homepage is a purple button. You can click on that and donate some cash. Say Anything is one of my favorite bands of all fucking time. So if you don't know who they are, just go to Spotify, look up Is A Real Boy, start there, and just consume each album after that. Luckily, Max heard Rama from Big Wheels Interview, episode 148, if you want to check that out after this one. And uh, he messaged me to chat, and we set up some time for this interview, and uh, that's what we talk about. Writing songs for people, playing for drive through the intro to Belt, Buddy Head, Rama from Big Wheel, How Fast It Is A Real Boy Blow Up, Anarchy My Dear, In Defense of the Genre, Amy Fiddler, and a ton more. This week's sponsor is Min 400 Records. Min 400 Records is an indie record label from New Jersey with bands across the United States, Canada, and Europe. The label features everything from indie rock and folk to post-punk and soul. Over 400 exciting releases. You can find Min 400 Records releases streaming on Spotify, Pandora, Tidal, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Deezer, and more, or at all MP3 outlets worldwide. Visit mint400records.com for links and more info. Here's a clip from their band Lady Bird's song, Regional Community Theater, which features Max on two tracks. Uh, it was originally released in 2007 and is available on all streaming platforms from Mint 400 Records. I won't be the hero, I simply trust fate. When my anguish moves forward at a most alarming rate. Forgive, I can't see you, can't look you in the eye. If I sail this ship further, my lake will surely run dry. Thank you again, Neil, for always sponsoring this shit. You are the best. Lastly, if you want to check out my comic, just go to Your Daily Bread on Instagram. And uh, it's a daily comic that I do every day for the last or over four years. It's just some side thing I do. Yeah, so you can go check that out. Just figured I'd give myself a shout out. That's all I got to say. So feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Kind of tell people real quick, like, what you're up to. I saw some stuff where you're doing these, like, live personal concerts through online or something right now. What is that? Yeah. Um, It's sort of like, I guess, sort of an extension of my song shop project. Um, I guess we're calling it Song Stream. And this would be that you, you still get one of those. You get a song written about you, but you get to see me actually write and perform it live. Because I I improvise those when I write them. So it's usually like a first take thing. So you're actually seeing it get written and recorded as I do it. And then I'll uh, play a few Say Anything songs after and kind of talk about the, you know, whatever you want in regards to the songs, kind of like a storyteller's vibe, you know, (laughs) VH1-ish specifically. Um, no, but so, so yeah, it's still focused a little bit on song shop, but it's also just kind of like, you know, invite a few people over and have some beers listen to like a live with glory of love and whatnot you know that's crazy dude do you ever like because so years ago you and i had so people listening like you we, we had connected a while back and i remember like i was texting you a bunch of stuff which i'm gonna repeat but there's one thing was when you were doing this years ago this is like 2000 2010 is when you started writing personalized songs for people 2009 yes. 2010 yeah i was gonna I think it was even a little bit before yeah, I thought it was. I, yeah, I think it was something like. It's been a, it's been a minute. It's, it's been crazy. A, it's been a spell. Yeah, it's definitely been a spell. <laughs> Two things I want to point out. Like this, I, one of these I just have to tell the story just for myself. But one, the first one, I was actually I'm divorced now, which is you know it's fine. But I was gonna actually pay you to write a song about me proposing to my ex at the time, and uh, I didn't do that. But um. Well, now you're happy. If now, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Come on, you can admit it. <laughs> but, but, two, but the other thing, the big thing I had said to you too, but I, I want to say it again. So, our wedding song. It's funny I'm talking about this, but it, my I, my wedding day back in the day when it was when we were happy was great. Um, but my our wedding song was Cemetery, and then we closed it out to Lost at Sea, which for people that not know that's an Isley song. And Love that. 
which is you know Max married to Sherry, and yeah. So and and that at time too, it's like I think that was right. It was, it was a couple of years like, after you guys got married or something. So it was such a sweet thing where I was like, I love these two bands, and it bookended it. But obviously, it was a it was a bad luck for my no what no, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we can well, exactly we, well, we can follow it up with like really bitter say anything song that you exactly. were probably listening to. Uh, like I hate everyone screaming or... a little. Yeah, exactly. And then we could do even yet another one where you kind of recover from the heartbreak and maybe I tend to you can still use the archetype. It's like maybe she was more like. Uh, my ex-girlfriend on the in defense era and you can really just project me on your entire <laughs> life <laughs> exactly that might have been the only inaccuracy was like which girl was the original you know metaphor it's true well i mean after many years of healing i've uh, i've grown and everything's fine but i think uh-huh, uh uh-huh. i'm just but, kidding yeah i so have i i, I hope <laughs> yeah exactly. yeah you can't hold that shit but like yes. My, I remember my thought was when you started doing that back then, and you know this this whole podcast is about nostalgia. We're gonna go back in the day and talk about the scene and all that stuff. But where we are now, um, does it ever like just freak you the fuck out that you're writing a song for someone and have to like do it, like for someone else, not for yourself, but for someone else? Is that like weird? Well, I think that's honestly the only thing that makes it doable for me or makes it fun or makes it uh, impactful enough for me to be okay with charging people money for it. You know what I mean? Like me being sort of keyed into the, the, the reality of that, which is such an incredible thing. You know what I mean? Like if I could think back to being like 15 years old and, you know, as you said, you know, nostalgia, just growing up on all these bands and whatnot and thinking that I could be one of them is is astonishing enough yet alone that we had some status where people would pay me enough just to write a song for them and it was the fact that they could connect to my music the way that i connect to you know the way i would listen at 16 years old to like alkaline trio yeah and like you know if i could have had skiba write a song about me and like the girl who was breaking my heart i would have literally paid like a thousand dollars literally like i would have yeah. saved up freaking whatever um but since it's a pretty affordable thing, I tend to go, okay, well, this is actually awesome. And it's a really cool thing for this person. It's definitely helping me live, you know, during a time where, you know, the music industry is kind of got, is going through a very weird time. So anything like this where it's personalized and I feel like it's making a big impact on someone's day and, and therefore their life in general, it's way easier to, to uh, morally get behind it and to just, connect to what I'm singing about. You know, a, a lot of my songwriting in general tends to be written in mind with the listener in mind, you know, a specific, specific kind of listener or whatever. Like I like to know what I'm writing for. So the fact that I'm writing for one person, as you said, like makes it actually more exciting because I kind of know perhaps what people want out of me in general. And therefore I think the songs tend to go over pretty well. Was there ever a song that you did where you were like, Ooh, I want to, I like this. And you actually played it live. Well, yeah, the first ever song shop song is it was actually ended up being a B side on self titled, um, which didn't come out, but is is floating around called I could be the president. It's I I love it. It's like one of my favorite sort of B it would come out on like a second rarities record, which I think we're going to do at some point. But um, um, around that era, like we, I recorded it for self titled and it was almost on the record. It was literally the first song shop i did where it was inspired completely by someone else but the funny thing is like i tend to relate to 90 percent if not 99 percent of the songs you know and you know the silly ones even like i just try to kind of reach into something in my life where it's almost like the opposite of the prototypical emo experience where i'm now searching for like something in their life to connect to that makes it like mine as opposed to like me watching Chris Caraba on stage and being like, wow, that reminds me of my girl. Like I'm doing the opposite <laughs> backwards. I'm like, oh, that reminds me of Sherry or that reminds me of something I, you know, and then I do actually emotionally connect to it, even if it is like on a very like mechanical level. It's every song has like me feeling it to some degree, even if I'm like kind of like in a Zen mode where I can do, you know, I think there was one point where my record was like 125 in one day of them. Wait, wait, what? 125 what? Songs. I love your reaction. Just made me feel so good about myself <laughs> and was so cute and and genuine. You're like, wait, 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 wait. No, but really, that that was my, that is my. In favorite. one fucking day, you did that. Yeah, Jeez. I've done it a couple times. Um, it's funny. The Guinness record or something is like is like ten. 
Uh, and no one knows that I, I do this. Well, some people do, but I, I can do that. Yeah, because basically, if you think about it, since I'm improvising them and recording the first time that I do it, it's not like I memorize it. Because imagine trying to you know, memorize any amount of songs, even five songs in one day to play it more than once. So I'm, do, I'm playing it straight, like a, um, a freestyle. And I, oftentimes I write songs like that, too. It's kind of just how I write. So it only takes as long as a song is to to record one. So if you think about it, if I, I could do 10 in, you know, if they're three minutes each in 30 minutes, Jesus. if I'm just recording it, you know what I mean? And I think a lot of people who who I don't know if you ever, you know, were in a band or any of that stuff. I'm, I'm spacing on if you were, but anyone who like is a songwriter, I think could do it. That's the thing. I really think it's just a mental block. Where people go, oh, I couldn't do that. If you can like sing and and um, and make up lyrics and stuff at, at once, think about like Jack Black when he's on stage. He's like, you know, oh motherfucker, I'm gonna come on your face tonight. Like that's every <laughs> five seconds he's coming up with something. Or comedians, that's all they do. Like it shouldn't really be that different. That's for, a like, good point. A song. Yeah, yeah. It's like comedians just kind of just spitting off the top of their head. Yeah, exactly. I, I think like the one thing I thought of. In the, this is like the last technical thing I'll talk about because people are like, what the fuck are they talking about? I think uh, the biggest thing came to my head is when, because I, I was in a band back in the day, and I, when I would write, you know, what I would get stuck up on is chord progressions because when I did one, I would always be like, you know, we always called the monkey progression, which was basically <laughs> damn it from Blink-182. Yeah, of course. Yes. And the, like the T, whatever it is. And, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, as soon as you did that, that was that that chord progression always had the greatest chorus or verse yes it, it has the best dynamic well, i have my like go-to's you know and all you really have to do is transpose it into different uh, keys and then it's kind of like there's an infinite you know as just as there isn't any infinite amount of songs to be written and in different genres and in different you know there's an infinite amount of songs that kind of are in like the foo fighters slash like say anything slash whatever trio like if you think about it, you know, all these bands doing songs and they're going to keep doing these songs, you know, there is an infinite amount of variations on kind of these. Plus, like in my sort of, I guess, repertoire, which is a really pretentious word, you know, like there's sort of like I can get away with kind of Beatlesy things and, and minor chords and little voicings and, and you know, post punk like little riffs and stuff like that. And all of those things are the kind of things that I can improvise at this point. So it's kind of like. It's not like I'm a shredder. It's just that I, I'm. Oh, you've done it too. You fucking. Sh- yeah, I, you have the weirdest. Do. You have the craziest style of <laughs> guitar, like sound. Like it's definitely crazy, but it's in service of like. It's trying to be effective, you know what I mean. It's trying to create. It's so, but it's like there's like this. We you. It's like the beginning of uh, the say anything. The uh, the third album. Well, technically not the third album, but like you know the the more add the popular ones. Um, they're like the beginning, like that. There wasn't a man like nee, nee, nee. like you have this like bend and shit that you do where I feel like you have ten fingers sometimes. I'm like, how the fuck does he get that sound? It's definitely like um a, a stretchy thing with my fingers, yes. but then also a lot of stuff on the records is overdubbed or like not overdubbed but like punched in. Like I have no shame about it. Everything I do sort of is in service. Uh, but th- yeah, there'll be some stuff that's totally weird and stretchy that I pull off because it's like I've done it so many times uh, or it comes with, like easy to me because I have a very, like you said, weird style of playing. So it's like, it might be easy for me, but then something that might be easy to someone else is really difficult for me. Well, it's like you're trying to say like 10 things in one chord. Exactly. Exactly. It's it, that, and that is something that I kind of, you know, I've done like these song songwriting classes um, in the past, like during COVID. And I feel like if you're a songwriter, being able to back yourself as a band on just one instrument as should be uh, at least doable with a song. And that's kind of like with song shop or anything that's like acoustic that I'm doing. You know, a lot of the songs are written just on an acoustic guitar. I don't really have like an electric setup until I like go in and start like recording. I'll just like play on acoustic guitar. A lot of these things are improvised, you know, like in that song, for instance, like the that was like written for, but then there's like a billion riffs in between that were pretty much improvised or or written with the producer and i'm just getting psyched in this a lot of the kind of crazier mathy stuff in the beginning we tried to kind of learn it and we would like in defense of the genre like we were kind of rehearsing songs over and over again to be able to like play little tiny but like after that it just became like when like pro tools became so ubiquitous it was like 
you know, we could be spending this time like with the, the, the vibe of the song and I could be spending that time on, on lyrics and stuff like that rather than like, you know, cause, cause it was never functionally a band in the sense of like, uh, you know, there's one guy who writes like the, the, you know, quote unquote rhythm guitar or the guitar on the left. And so his entire, like, you know, his, his focal point creatively is to, to learn those and write those parts and make them awesome. So the fact that there wasn't that meant it could be whatever we needed it to be. Um, and that took away kind of some of the, the rigidness of the, like the writing process or the recording process. And it can be like, whatever the fuck works, let's do it. Yeah. You can hear the difference too, between in defense of the genre to the, the um, self titles. It's like in defense of the genre was like, Hey, let's do everything. Yeah, exactly. Every fucking thing possible. Even though like is a real boy is kind of like that, but it's way more packaged. And then it's like in defense of the genre, like you kind of just were like, let's blow the whole thing up. And then the self titled was like, all right, let's repackage it. But it's like way more polished in like in package with like hits yeah focus it was like we wanted to kind of just brand ourselves and that's why it's self-titled it's like you know if if you were to like make a uh cliche version of say anything it would be the, that album well it's funny too because well that's also when you guys like all wore the same uniform too so exactly kind of like... we wanted it to be a comment on like on the i guess commercialization of the band to some degree so let's kind of like go back in time to when you got Gigi. into the theme. Sorry, my dog is loudly. I have this. Uh, it's, okay, <laughs> you got it easy. That doesn't mean come over here. That doesn't mean come over here. Okay. What kind, what kind of dog is it? She's a Mastiff. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I've got three and the new one is a Mastiff and she's just gigantic puppy. It's the cutest thing ever, but she's like doesn't know her size and just like flops around. Okay, can you at least sit? You're literally, your breathing is going to be audible. You've got like a you got a lot going on the house. How many kids you have now? It's like really four? yeah. I've got five, five, and then three giant do- three wow, dogs. Wow, that, that must yeah. just be like constant electricity at all times. So you're it's out. wonderful. Yeah, it's like once you kind of uh, give up your autonomy in life. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but like to some degree, <laughs> yeah, it's just really nice and comforting. You know what I mean? Like there's never those. I just remember growing up, like how much of my maybe this has something to do with me loving this setup is like. A lot of my life was very like lonely in high school. Like, you know what I mean? Even even though I had friends and I was not like an outcast, it was like I was like a brooding type a lot at home and would just kind of like walk around listening to punk music by myself, or, like walk to like the record store and buy a record. Like there was a lot of just thinking by myself. And I like the fact that I don't really get time to think by myself. You know, I've done, I've done enough of that. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, even in my head, like, you know, uh, on an ongoing basis, based on like the kind of person I am, there's like a dialogue that tends to be like a neurotic dialogue that I've learned to kind of shut out and, you know, through like, you know, Zen and meditation and stuff like that. But still, you know, still like, you know, I'm naturally wired to be constantly like, oh, what's going on? (laughs) And so like, I'm just like, oh, look, a dog, I will pet it. Oh, look, a kid, I will feed it. Oh, I will hug the cute kid. It's just very like. It's re- it's actually more relaxing, I think, than most people would probably think it is, but it's definitely like involving. So that's a good way to kind of go back to the past, because you're talking about at that time, kind of being alone, like being by yourself, and then going to record stores and stuff. So that obviously led to you getting in the scene. So like talk, like what was that transition of like what brought you into that whole scene in the very beginning? Honestly, what. <sighs> The scene as it stands, if you're going to define it as sort of late '90s scene, late '90s. Scene. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like me, I I would say it was actually me playing for drive through because that was what got me uh, potentially into this industry and knowing that I could do it professionally. I was a fan of punk music, but it was more so like skate punk. And stuff like that. And and I was a pretty dedicated. I was like a big music fan. So I was already into music. I was at the point where like, you know, I liked corn when I was like 12 or 13. And I would get every corn album. <laughs> you know, it's like I would, de- you know. Oh, God, I love that album. That first album. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I went to the Family Values tour. But but anything I liked, I would go hard on it and try to like, you know, I, I was finding out that I loved music. And that was because of punk music, I think. Because before I loved music, 
but I would just get an album and like it a lot. Like I would get Oasis or Weezer or like Dookie and, you know, when I was like 10 or whatever. And it was, it was like a passive thing, even though I loved it probably more than most things, then probably punk music. I would say like skate punk got me to the point where I was buying like compilations and stuff and going to some shows. Like I went to go see like, you know, no use for a name or like face to face or something like that no effects but it was not like i was the kind of person who would like my life was dedicated to those bands at all also because i did not skate i was like not a punk necessarily i just liked it and i was starting to write songs i think because of i think the first the album that made me it was my first year uh in high school and i rediscovered pinkerton and i started writing i was like oh i can write something like this um, and so I wrote my first song, but this was around the time. It's funny, the transitional record for me. And I think it is for a lot of people. They just don't talk about it because they there's some weird embarrassment um, because they're not the most credible band, but they're actually pretty great. Is like the Ataris. When oh. They, oh, yeah. When they came out like they were not on a big label. They were on fat record. So they were like the first sort of emo ish band in the like West Coast skater, no effects, like scene. Yeah. Like the first band to put like stars on everything, like star tattoos on every single person. <laughs> yep. Um, and sing about girls and stuff. So it was like the first one there where they were blatantly singing about girls. I'm like, oh, this is a good call. Like this seems, and I remember I had heard Sunny Day Real Estate. So you're basically taking some of this stuff and you're mixing with the punk thing. I like that. You're using the octave chords a lot. I like that. And then I, you know, drive through records at that time, you know, I didn't know them for, and they weren't even doing much emo. They were like a ska punk label. They were known for like Phoenix TX and pharmaceutical like band. Yeah, exactly. Mother mania, a lot of really random, uh, you know, and so that was what I knew them for. And we like, we really liked those bands. And so I sent them a random email and I'm like, hey, I want to use, you know, it was true. I was like a film student in high school. So I wanted to use one of their songs for, and of course, I could have anyway. But I was like trying to start talking to them. God knows why. And I was like, hey, I actually write songs too. Can I, you know, if you guys ever want to hear my songs, like literally just like e- eager 15 year old kid, you know, like never played a show, never played a show, never really played my songs for anyone except for like my friends, legit, which is crazy when you think about it. And my mom drove me to, you know, wherever the hell they lived, which was like some suburb of L.A. And and uh, I played for them in their garage with, with like all, you know, their drive through offices were in the garage, I believe, at their time. It was Calabasas, I think. And when they... Yeah, exactly. Which is fucking weird. And so then they're like, I, I finished, I think, my first song. And Stephanie was like, we'll sign you right now. I had no idea you were on drive through. We were not. We oh. didn't end up on drive through, but that was the beginning of my career. A hundred percent owe it to them. A hundred percent. So okay, so you put, like leading up to this though, you you're listening to music and you're writing songs. So obviously you are. Are you just picking up a guitar and just strumming and being like, this sounds yeah. good? Or okay. Well, I had taken guitar lessons like around twelve years old, and I was at the point where you know I would hang out with my friends and like play whatever. You know, we would like cover songs together or whatever. You know, just that dorky, cute. 13 year old guy who plays guitar phase, you know, um, that we all tend to go through if you're, if you are at that point, um, I did not take it completely seriously, but when I started to write songs, I did take it seriously. I was like, well, this, this could be something. I think I knew as soon as I had written one, because I was pretty discerning in my taste. I was like, I think I would have known if I was really bad, I would have just done something else because like, I knew um, I wanted to make movies and I wanted to write. That was originally what I wanted to do was to write. You know, before that, I wanted to just make comic books. It's really what I wanted to do. And then in high school, I wanted to be a director. So these are the things that I like thought I could actually be good at um, based on my mind. I knew I would never be a good you know, banker. I knew I would never be a good fucking like baseball player. So I didn't really do those things. I would just do what I felt like I could actually, you know, pull off. And so when I started writing, I was like, this, this is kind of good. And like, I played it for, you know, some friends and, you know, Kobe and me were starting the sort of loosely starting the band at that point. So I had played him for Kobe and he, he thought they were great. So I'm like, okay, I had some confidence just from playing them for a few people. I'm like, I guess I'm going to just try randomly playing them for this record company. You know, like there was no, and I understood the significance of record companies because I was like a fan of punk music. So it was all about the record company. You know, it was like, oh, Fat Rack, sign this man. You know, it was like, 
but it hadn't gotten yet to the point of full scene, you know? So like that was my transition into it, I think. Cause right around that time, I want to say right after I got that, they basically were like, we're going to take you, we're going to take you to MCA because they were doing that deal with MCA and we're going to like have play, have you play for them. You're going to be like, and by the way, like this is my, my uh, not humble brag. I find it to be pretty cool fact that no one knows about me considering that I ended up having a career is that they're like, you're going to be this guy who we put at punk shows with an acoustic guitar and you're going to play and kind of be play these emotional songs on an acoustic guitar playing with by yourself pre dashboard. So they wanted me to be that. And then I got into a fight with them over some dumb crap as everyone tends to do, or they, during that time, every one of those bands did. Um, and then they signed dashboard or, or tr attempted to. So, so technically they wanted me to be dashboard before dashboard Interesting. Or, or right around the time that he was doing it in Florida, but before he got signed to, to, uh, to drive through and then vagrant. So that was their concept for me. It was like this young dude who would have maybe some bit different bands and on their label back me occasionally, but mostly it was like me playing, you know, pop punk songs on acoustic guitar. So I'm so fascinated by this because this is like you're in California at the time and then between here and then you then at some point you end up in New York. Yeah, that was like, like everything. My entire self did a 180 during that time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was gonna say because like so I when the first time I heard about you was when I was it was like the middle of the 2000s, like the beginning of the 2000s. And this is like when I was despising bands of the, the early 2000s coming. I was like, what is this shit that changed everything? And then I talk about this all the time. And then I started listening to it. I was like, oh, my God, a lot of these bands are fucking amazing. And I had heard about you guys. And then I got is a real boy. I remember the day I bought it. I was going to a, a friend's uh, surprise birthday party. So I bought that. And what was the Every Time I Die album with um, oh, Hot Damn or something? Hot, no, it was the one after Hot Damn. It was like Oh, Gutter Phenomenon. Gutter Phenomenon. Yeah, which is That's really not record. that good. But like I I like it. Oh man, <laughs> I like it. I, their newest album I think is the best album they ever written. All of them are really good. I mean, you can't really knock them. You know what I mean? I don't know if they've made like a bad song ever. <laughs> it's like kind they're of great. I mean, Gutter Phenomenon is like it's good, but the all the other ones afterwards, I was like, holy shit. Yes. And then yes. They got they got more heavy. Radical is the fucking best one. Like it's great, hands down. But so I bought Got a Phenomenon at the same time as I bought yours, which is so opposite. And I remember driving to the party and I put I put it in and it starts with Bell and I was just like, this is fucking incredible. And like I just listened to the album straight through and then I just continued that for years. It was I was like, this is so fucking insane. So the, me and my buddies would geek out on it. And he's like, yeah, that, that dude used to, he had another album. He's like, he had like six albums or something before this. And I was like, yeah, what the exactly. fuck? And then later on, I got the rarities, the first one that you're, you know, before the second one you're thinking of doing. And so at that time, the rarities, I went and bought that years later when I came out. And I was like, holy shit, this guy had so much stuff. So I didn't realize that all of this was leading up to Israel Boy. It was and it wasn't, though. I think your concept of it is A, normal, and B, kind of what we wanted it to be. Because it, I started so young. You know, the band, I start, keep in mind that that thing with drive through. I was, you know, 14, I was 15, I think. And what? So and, and that's 2001? Or is that... was, yeah, 2000. The band started in 2000, so I think it was around that time. Between then and when I did as a real boy, there was like four years. So that's like four years of, you know. Whereas there were bands I knew that were like 17, and therefore everything they did got released. Like um, Saves a Day got signed, you know, around a little bit. Like they were probably 17, but because they were kind of then put on tour and actually putting out albums they had to go into this traditional cycle where, you know, they're writing so I'm sure Chris was writing a ridiculous amount of songs, but like they were sort of, you know, concentrated on albums and comps the way like right. the old bands are. Yes. But when you're just a random 16 year old kid who isn't signed, you're like writing songs every day. You're doing whatever the hell you want. And yeah, but you were, but you also like recorded this shit, which is just alone in, my, but with, like with the 16 track, you know what I mean? Like yeah, all but of the, the songs fucking track. like hold up though. They're really good. Thank you. Well, I, if if so, it's just kind of like, you know, whatever quality that I either had or still have, if you dig it, you know, it was definitely there because it's so me, um, you know, and so I, I guess that does come across, but but it's like almost like I could do, 
it was really a growing process. And so I really do, you know, there's parts of me that still consider is a real boy, our first album. Oh, totally. um, Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's a hard thing to say, you know, whether, whether baseball is like a demo or whether it's our first album at the time, of course, we wanted it to be like a fucking our first album. And for a local band, it was quite successful in terms of like, we became sort of the first scene, scene sort of emo band in the scene where we were. There were no other bands in L.A. Um, doing the exact kind of thing we would do, bands that sounded like, I guess, the Get Up Kids or Saves a Day. And we were in a scene at the time that centered around like Phantom Planet, Rooney. It was like this L.A. Um, sort of post-celeb scene. <laughs> and we kind of would play with those bands, but we were like kind of a more scrappy emo band. And so a lot of the kids that had different tastes would come see our band. And we were like a big local band. We opened for like Promise Ring. We opened for um, like something corporate got kind of obsessed with us and wanted to take us and get get us signed and all this stuff. But this was all shit that could have happened to any local high school band. And then we would have gone on and be, been like bankers again. You know what I mean? Like the <laughs> fact that we were a big local band, it wasn't like we were trying to, I mean, we all wanted to be rock stars and be on tour, legitimately, 100%. I, all I wanted to do was be in a band on tour. But at the same time, it was it was a youthful, you know, so only once I basically went to college and, you know, I was like, okay, I'll try out college to my parents. And it was a really, I had started doing drugs and it was like, there was a descent from that idealism into like a kind of, I would say, an apt, you know, pretty, pretty, um, average 19 year old confusion, anger, all these things, loneliness, judging myself. And I went through that the same way everyone does. Cause I was in New York. I didn't have my band. My band had sort of gone on hiatus. I was at Sarah Lawrence uh, college in New York. And, and that's where kind of the admitted, you know, being immersed in like this sort of false, I, you know, uh, bohemian mm-hmm. lifestyle. And so I basically, you know, went from, it wasn't like there was this real experience of touring and all these things. Um, and then like, you know, it was rebooted and and we got signed. It was like, that wasn't anything really compared to like me descending into almost what I would, you know, real, real ass life um, in high school where I was like, you know, I'd like slept with a girl for the first time when I was 18, you know, all these things that were like real ass experiences. And um, that isn't to diminish the songs I wrote before it, but I think that's why, you know, I, th- I think that there's a separation because that's when I really started from ground zero to some degree and literally started like sending out, you know, what we had and demos of the new songs. And that's where, that's why no one really knew me at all in the scene. Like, it's like we were big in LA amongst private school kids in LA. We were not like a scene band in LA. We didn't tour with like the format or there was, there was some, a lot of it was concentrated in Orange County. There was a crossover with like that, like scene in LA, but really we didn't, we didn't cross over that much with it. We had our own thing. And then I was like, fuck that. I want to like be in one of these bands that I actually love. I want to be one of them. I want to be on one of these labels that I love and I want to really do it. But that took dropping out of college. So to, and then the most roundabout way to answer your question, I think entering the scene would be like, it would be when I was in high school, but it was more as a fan. It wasn't like we were. Um, oh, totally. It was like someone gave me through being cool. My, my uh, pretentious, though amazing cousin, who's, who's older than me and ran a zine and managed the national and went to Yale. He's like, oh, I got the CD to review. Uh, I, I think it's okay, but I think you'll really like it. And he gives it to me. And he's like, just take it, whatever. I don't want it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. Jesus. And I listened to it. I'm like, life changer. Immediately just walked around listening to it repeatedly over and over again. And when I got back from my trip to New York where I got the thing, I think I wrote our junior varsity EP. Um, and that had like the first songs for say anything that were, I guess you could kind of say was emo ish for say anything. Was that you one know, walk first, through is walk through hell on that one? It was even before that. It was like before baseball, like because even baseball kind of has some like a lot actually of, of stuff that sounds like say it's a day, blah blah blah. But our band would have sounded like Lagwagon or something if it wasn't for that. It wasn't for like you know saves a day. And then I was like saw the connection between that and drive through. Because I had just played for Drive Through, keep in mind, and they were like, you know, I was going to be their guy, and so I'm like, wait, this is connected to like, I, I can't believe this random kind of very weird hardcore-ish band is connected somehow to like this band, A Newfound Glory, um, and that is on Drive Through too. And so I like, 
you know, and I met those guys because Drive Through took me to a show and introduced me to a newfound glory or whatever at the time. And I, I, it was just this transition that honestly, I think if we're talking nostalgia and we're talking the scene, I think the whole scene, whether it was on the East Coast from like hardcore into this, and then the West Coast from like skate punk, literally like you look at Vagrant Records, it was like face to face, blah, 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 the hippos and stuff, transitioned it via Saves the Day and the Get Up Kids into you know that being the biggest thing oh yeah they were monster yeah i mean but but and that was that was my transition as a fan when i was 15 and that's the time where you get most into you know music i was there during that transition and going to shows where you know saves was opening for face to face but then they blow them away and all these by the way i'm still obsessed with face to face i have a face to face tattoo but you know at the time it was like it was a huge upheaval so that to me is when i first got you know, it's not like I was some kind of kid who was listening to like Sunny Day and the like, or like was listening to really cool indie music, or like you know, um, I'm trying to, or like Slint, or so. You know, it's like I was literally liking very cheesy pop punk music, and then emo supplanted it as the main sort of popular pop punk type music, and then from there, then I started getting into indie rock, um, kind of post punk, all those things. Saves got me to go back into Fugazi. All that stuff. So I was listening to not credible music. Then, I, you know, I continued even to this day to listen to not credible music, but at least saves open my eyes to like underground music. So I think that's to answer your question. That's that's what it was. Yeah. And it's a it's a it's a wild story, too, because I remember when the way that I always perceived it, and I think it's pretty much stands till now, it's it, you clearly came out and it was very well known that you loved save the day like every article i read you yeah, like yeah. my god i fucking love this and then you got to do two tongues later on um but like i always thought as you were this total like i don't know if this is the right word like not fanboy but like just a giant like a, like a fan that would have been wide-eyed at a show so excited to watch a band and all of a sudden then you were put on a stage from writing song not like you just you were put there like you made your way there no that's a great and very accurate way of of understanding my experience yeah and it's like i could see and i'd see that every time so it was wild to see because i've seen you guys play like i was actually going back i was like wow i've seen you guys play like like six or seven times i think that's amazing man like, over the years yeah and it's been like new york portland oregon and uh, carbro like all over the place Oh, I love Carbro. Yeah, the last the last show um, I saw you guys was in Carbro. I think Hot Rod opened for you guys. Oh, and, sick! Yeah, and you guys came out and just like the whole place just like went nuts. It was it was such yeah, a good, I love that place. Such a That's one of the few show. places where I just like I'm now stoked to go there on tour because we haven't toured yet, but I'm stoked to do it. Yeah, I saw you just played. I know I'm jumping off the place. So you just played a live show the other day. Yourself, it was friggin' right? crazy. It was really amazing and way easier and more fun than I uh, thought it might be. I was definitely scared and anxious leading up to it, but oh, I it, bet. Was, it was great. It was yeah. great. Yeah, actually, I saw. Um, I'm kind of jumping over this, but like, I saw. We saw Take It Back Sunday there too, because Adam's from down here, and that was cool. But they like this is such a side story. But they opened up. He's like, "We're gonna play our brand new album," and I look at my friend. I was like, "No, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. You have to." really hardcore to like i think you'd have to be like my level of fan of saves a day and like they were by like by far my favorite band to actually be down to hear the full new album they would have to be by far your favorite band for you to be like okay cool i want to like dissect these songs oh you are spider-man apparently but i am doing this uh, interview so you have to go watch he's gonna get really bummed it's gonna make me look like a bad father go ahead thank you oh i know you look amazing though you look like definitely like Spider Man. Can you close the door? Please. I think that's my favorite thing. I've had a bunch of interviews where the kids have always come in, and it's so it's a great just like the like the parents. Are it's like, okay, always okay, something honey. epic. Like they're holding a piece of poo and just brandishing <laughs> it. They're like, yeah. Like they can't come in and just be like, what's up? They have to do something really cute or gross or weird, you know. That and that's why having kids is so fun. Like they're just a constant. It's like a sitcom. Yeah, you like, get to like you get to have joy again. <laughs> like oh, real, yeah, they're, real they're honest joy. So and then here comes the other one. That's insane. Really? <laughs> I know. This one's nuts. She's really fun. Sherry? This is so funny. Baby. Wow. <laughs> Straight up. I love this it. one's this one's a punk. Hi. Hi, thank you. Do you want to close the door? I'm so sorry. Um, 
Um, so it was so I, I love that by the way. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah. So Take Back Sunday gets up and like yeah. To your point, the only band that I've ever been like give me more and more constant new stuff. Um, it's been Sunday Day Real Estate. Sunday Day Real Estate is like my fucking. Yes, like, there you go. If Jesus they were Christ. to play a whole new album live right now, you'd be like, fuck yeah. Like, just kind of sit down at the bar and actually sit and listen to it. You don't want to be necessarily, and I love them, but you don't want to be at a take it back. So they show, they do the whole new album. No, and he starts, and he's like, oh, and super side, side, side. No, you can listen to the unreleased Sunday Day Real Estate stuff. It's on YouTube mm. if you search for it. I'll send what? you What? But uh, fucking, yeah, so to just finish the to bookend, the whole take back Sunday, they say that. I look at my friend, I was like, you're fucking kidding me. And then they play it, and they leave, and they come back out, and they played all the hits, and the place just erupted. And it was one of the best things I've seen. So it was like it reminded me of the same energy when you guys came out, and the place was just like bouncing. And then I think you brought like you had some girl in the crowd sing Molly, like started with yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It That's was awesome. Dope. Um, but okay, so what I always saw it as is like this wide-eyed fan got put on stage, and then you got to you build this career until now and you were writing all these records these you you recorded like baseball and all this stuff when you were in college right in your dorm uh, ba- it was um it's funny a lot of the stuff that is called the dorm room demos was written in high school um but there were a few things written in my dorm in at sarah lawrence um you know it was like the, there was a few songs right before but Writing is a real boy was the main thing that happened. It, I started writing is a real boy in my dorm room in Sarah Lord. So it was like I transitioned between walk through hell and stuff and want to know your plans. Um, we're like my senior year and there was a few other songs. Um, wow. But then when I got to college and sort of went dark, so to speak, that was when I was like, I want to just redefine what this band sounds like. And, and Bell was the first song I wrote that was like the new style and then it ended up being the first song too because it was like the lyrics i tend to write like that where it's like a you know a, some kind of fucking sci-fi novel where once you kind of like embrace a concept you know like it's gonna keep going or it's gonna like be definitive so it wasn't like i would write belt and then go back to a song that sounds like you know friggin' the ataris i was like okay no we are now like a dark sort of post-punk band and anything we do is going to be kind of refracted through that lens yeah, uh, at least for now. And so, like everything that came after that was very much so in the vein of Israel Boy. So that transition was in in college. Okay, I just have to know this too because you said Bell, and I'm gonna go back for a second. But what the fu- when you play that recording of you talking to you like your therapist in the beginning? Yeah, my talking? dad. Oh, your dad. <laughs> I I thought it was you talking to. A, like a therapist or something because i because it could be i thought it for someone told me this years ago they're like dude he starts the album he's like talking to his therapist about, like he's got anxiety about something i was talking to my dad about how i have anxiety because oh like, my we, god really i neurotic never too. fucking knew that this is i yeah, love that i just learned this right now oh and he's, uh we were just in the car and i and i um i recorded him without him knowing it and it was just me like talking because you know i tended to be intend to be very open about you know my neurotic shit so i was just like Oh, I gotta, you know, do this thing. I gotta get ready for this. And, you know, it's like he, I got that from him because he was like very neurotic guy who was in the entertainment industry as well. And so we would talk about the sort of like, you know, that, that end of it, which was being uh, nervous or being scared or being annoyed by everything. Um, you know, so, so he was, he was definitely one to go to if I was, you know, having this creative need that I, I knew I wanted to have some kind of intro, but I didn't know what would be significant or cool enough to make as the intro. So I was like having anxiety about that creative struggle. I was like, oh, it needs to be something really fucking good. This is the first thing people are going to hear. It's so like, genius, oh. dude. It's so <laughs> fucking genius because it's so hilarious because you're like saying this and then you're like, I'm on the fence about this. And your dad's like, is that it? And it's like, then you say it and it just blasts into this fucking song. And I was like, oh, this it is going to take me somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's like hilarious. And all of a sudden the, the guitar riff happens. I'm like, where is this taking me right now? And I was like, oh, it shit. It is weird as fuck. Like, it's very weird. Like the fact, like it is ubiquitous I, and I can't, it's very still surreal that, and thank you so much, by the way. Like, it's really nice that, 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 that it, it, that it did that for you. Oh like, my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally. But, and like, you know, we've done, we've come out to it and, and, you know, I've heard that intro on record so many times, but it is really fucking weird because it's like, 
this weird recorded part and then me saying something out loud and then this riff that's also a buildup. So it's this extreme buildup to a moment um, in like three different ways yeah. before we actually even like kind of hit with the band and you know even what the fuck you're listening to. But I know that like by that time I was so obsessive as a listener and also an obsessive fan. Like you said, it was really um, – you know, I had keep in mind, I think that's what does separate me from a lot of these people. It was like our band didn't get to tour. Our band didn't get to do anything. But we had gotten so close as to almost, you know, be signed to these labels to almost be signed to a major label when I was like 17, you know, playing for MCA. And it was like this tease it, having never gone on one tour, you know. And so I was like so eager studying, you know, I was the biggest music fan. And I was like. You know, one of the things I always loved was like big first songs, you know, so I think at your funeral by by saves a day or something. Oh, yeah. Like I was like, I everything was like, I have to outdo that. I have to outdo that. I, it has to be as good as that. You know, like I wanted to make something that could stand up to I think if we had put out baseball, you know, it would have maybe led to some kind of success. But I don't think it would have been the same because it wasn't oh, the no. same first impression. You know what I mean? So I want. So that like intro and everything, like it was a very conscious of its first impression to the point where it's like talking about being conscious. of. The first so, so, so the one thing that just, this is what I, this is like to kind of bring this together, like where from being that wide eyed kid in the, in the crowd. And then you're like, all right, I get my chance. I do all these demos. I doesn't work. You know, it's, I stop, I go to college, I do that stuff. And then it's almost like that beginning of that. It starts off where you want to root for you like through that album right and but like it, you start off it's what i got from it is that you're being honest and then when you cut it off as that's it i'm like oh this guy is humor because it's at the perfect spot and then it goes into you saying it which means like you got the confidence and it's almost like this kid who wanted it so bad he got it and he gets to say this and say like all right i'm gonna lead this in and go and that's what i saw it as is like that's beautiful man wow yeah. Wow. That's such a very, wow. That's such a cool way of defining say anything in general is, is I think that is what, you know, that band stood for, for me. It was like, there's a, there is a cynicism and sort of a knowledge of how it works, which I think divided us in a good way from, you know, the, like early starting line, you know what I mean? Like, they're, like they were just sincere, you know, they were fully in it and, and great musicians and smart guys. But it, with us, it was, there was a knowledge of, of being coming being a next generational fan of all this stuff so all the things that we would kind of laugh at or point out um that every fan does you know i've you know ken ken from the starting line is a good friend of mine he knows all these things that were funny at the time and you know all these emo bands would joke about amongst themselves about all the cliches and all these things but because i was coming at it later i was like we have to at least be honest because i did see it falling off i saw it before it even fell off i knew it was going to fall off really hard um what was and that's why I, just emo like i knew oh. it, there was going to be a reckoning because there was for hair metal you know there was for grunge it had there was for every fucking classical music like the things that were kind of cheesy i guess you could say about emo were gonna bite it in the ass you know i was like kind of a student of music at that point so you look at these trends you know obviously you get sunny day who's pretty much like you know the fugazi of, of emo and you know like you go from minor threat and hardcore and then somehow you end up at you know i'm trying to think of some like corn you know, it's like it's it's and then it cycles again it goes from being like underground and sincere to be so i was like kind of very much and continued to be uh i hope keyed into that process and that sort of cyclical thing and i saw you know like around that time it was like the used came out right so it's like i saw how it went from saves a day even like sunny day to saves a day from saves a day to now it's being packaged by a major label and it, oh yeah it was packaged by a major label she's like i totally agree um, with the used and I'm like, okay, well then if this is becoming like almost of a new hair metal, because now, and I liked the used, by the way, I liked those bands. I think that's what you're saying is like, I could sort of dissect and make fun of the things that were, you know, going on, but I was still someone who would like be nervous meeting Matt prior from the get up kids at that point. You know, I was a fanboy. I was, and very much so my personality too, you know, was very wide eyed and, underneath very innocent i think as a person that is kind of how i am as a person too is like i have an innocent uh very 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 
innocent core, but then like my sort of weathered outerness is like the most fucked up, <laughs> dark, um, you know, like expectation of all things failing and and just like being ready for the worst shit ever. Because I've seen some seriously fucked up shit for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so that is what the band was about, was, was being really sincerely into Saves a Day, but then being, I think, I guess, woke enough about the whole thing to know that like some like the yeah, yeah, yeahs were coming out and that, you know, we needed to be kind of a mix of those things. One of the questions I wrote down was you have this, you incorporate this very circusy kind of sound in playfulness and that, and like, and that comes in from um, Israel Boy and like you, so you add that in there. It was there, was that like part of like, what brought that into that? How did that get introduced to your sound? I think it was there from the beginning because like around, I was into musicals to some degree. I was never like a glee level kid, but like, it was actually, it was funny at my like sort of Jewish high school or uh, Jewish uh, pre high school. Um, and like uh, day school, it was like cool to be in the musical, like to get the lead in Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. It was like super cool. And everyone, all the girls knew the like words to Greece. Like it is like, so like, you know, it was actually kind of cool. So that kind of thing was like incorporated already. I think the drama of it was in the early stuff, but it wasn't so blatant as, you know, something like, whoa. Um, because yeah. Because I think okay. it was just the innate emotionality and the, the drama, like the sort of over the topness was very musical. And the way I would sing about, like even on those demos in baseball, there was a lot of talking about things that are just narrative or commonplace, but with a lot of drama and emphasis on it, the way you would in a musical. Like I'm cleaning my shoe, you know? And so like that was the, the whole, and I just found that really funny. And I got back into Queen in a big way um, around senior year. And I was like, oh God, I got into Night at the Opera. And I was like, this is amazing. And imagine if he wasn't even singing about anything so much as like, we are the champions. Exactly. <laughs> what, what happened? Well, it's a long story. It's what I'm trying to explain. I don't know. What happened with you? Okay. She's giving me attitude. She doesn't like that. Okay. Um, but I basically was like, what if Freddie Mercury was singing like Woody Allen uh, comedy? You know what I mean? Like, so it would be funny. It would be a funny juxtaposition bad example well it's like you kind of i mean that's the whole thing is like that whole album is you're you're basically being self-deprecating and you're also shitting on the scene and you're also like like exploding of things you want to say and then like and you add this tone to it like it um like admit it like you're like yeah i'm gonna just talk through this song instead of really sing it till the yeah, end, gotcha, shit on everyone. by the end of the album I'm just like okay yeah like, yeah and I was gonna, get i'm just gonna <laughs> like just full-on ramble and just just shit on people <laughs> which is so great yes. but like Thank so you. so when you're you're doing this and obviously i know you've probably had so many interviews where they talk about this album and you've said it in length and all that but oh all good like it's what still like such a nice thing to even that people care enough to dissect it you know, oh like, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, like I've had this shit in my head. Actually, and the one thing too is what, I, just to really, the fact that before when you were in with your dad, I've always the reason I was so confused. Just to cap mm-hmm. that off, was I was like, this guy just called someone. He's asking a question. I'm like, and then the the person's in a car. I was like, oh, I don't why I don't like that doesn't <laughs> make any fucking sense to me. And now that yeah, we were you, driving around L.A., kind of right near my house, and I was just kind of like. I didn't know you were with. Up. I didn't know you were with him. I always thought you called him and recorded it from your phone. I was like, this sounds literally like, recording sense. it with, I think, an actual tape recorder because it was like pre iPhone and everything. So but I and I had had I had the idea, you know, for the for the thing, but I was like, didn't know it was the right thing, and I was like, wait, my I I basically had the thought. I'm like, my inner dialogue about this is so funny and pretentious <laughs> that I'm thinking so hard about it that it almost should be on record. <laughs> Because just saying in the record begins with a song of rebellion is almost too confident, you know, like because everything was in that sort of self-referential vein. Yeah, <laughs> it's so great. I mean, so on the same time though, so what was the name of the producer of the record? Um, Tim O'Hare. Tim O'Hare. Yes. So when you're in studio with this guy and you're, it's like you go from Stephen demo- Trask co-produced it, who did um, Hedwig and the Angry Inch as well. Okay, that that was it. Because I remember my buddy told me about that because his wife. Um, she loved that movie, and so when your album came out, he was talking about that. 
So there's obviously that theatrical part of it too when you work with them. So when you're doing this and you're this young dude getting like the beginning of what you didn't even realize what the fuck was going to happen, like w when you're in the studio doing this, did you have like did you pull back and say like were you kind of intimidated or did you just say all right I'm bringing it all to the table and I not like I don't care who you are but it, bringing it care. all to the table didn't care who they were completely really? I was like you know like I was like I want to be the next fucking Weezer or Green Day you know like and and to be honest you know thank thank God. You know, it, of course it was coffee. Of course I was like, you know, 19 years old. But a lot of you, everyone kind of has that energy when you're in a band. Um, you know, when you're, or a lot of people do when you're, when you're just starting out, you know, when you're, when you're hanging out and like, I'm not saying everyone like would smoke weed or, but you're like you're smoking a doobie and you're all like, Hey, yo, we could be the fucking Beatles, man. And it's like, so I was just like honest about it. And, and I, I held my songwriting to what I considered a high um, benchmark because it, it, there was on, so much honesty in it. I think if I had tried to be really poetic like Jer, I often bring up Enoch as an example of someone I could never write like because it's so sincere and so poetic. You know, I knew I could not do that, but I was, I knew I had something the way that like probably Seinfeld had something. Mm. You know, that there yeah. was something about my sense of humor. Um, and maybe like my sense of melody and the ability to write like a pop song or kind of a cathartic pop song and to express my emotions kind of the way Saves a Day did. But I knew that on top of that, it was really more about my writing style and how I could, because um, it's like, those were the things amongst my group of friends that we would laugh at. Like that was our sense of humor was just being extremely honest about our dysfunction. And I think a lot of people, that's the deal. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and that's why so many people our age or whatever around the same age uh, attached to it because everyone was kind of laughing at the same things. Like, look at me. I just like spilled a bunch of like I'm eating a Slim Jim and I this is disgusting. You know, it's like um, but no one would sing about those things. So I felt like it was kind of a novel idea um, and I felt like no one was doing it. So when I went into it, I was like definitely like. You know, you hear stories of people who are sort of enterprising and get ahead in life. And as long as you have something that's genuine and isn't like greedy. Like I wasn't interested in money. You know, I was not interested in being cool. I wasn't interested in getting a whole bunch of girls from it. I just wanted to make a positive impact on the world. And I wanted it to be me who did it, you know, and to the point where I was like, it was embarrassing. I was like, I, I need to be the one to save the world. <laughs> you know, and I think you had every emo band the the guy wanted to be the one to save the world. I mean, you have save the world, lose the girl by my buddy Gabe in Midtown. It's like, that's such an apt way of putting it. You know, it, that was the narrative for every dude. It's like, I'm going to be the one to save her. Like she's hurting herself, you know? And so I felt like that was funny because I felt it in myself a little bit, but at least I had the self-knowledge. And as the scene kind of woke up to the fact that this was becoming a little contrived, I wanted to be the first one to call it. I was like, they're going to, people are going to figure this out. And then it's going to be like hair metal and everyone's going to know it's kind of cheesy. Um, so I was like, we got to do this. We got to get this out. We got to really, I think someone else would have done it. Like, I think I remember hearing we had just recorded his real boy or we were doing the demos and Deja, whatever by brand new came out. I'm like, okay, this is a little bit closer to what I'm doing. Cause like there's some self consciousness here and I clearly the dude is listening to like the pixies and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay guys, there's actually a time crunch. <laughs> like things are moving so fast that, you know, if it isn't me, it's going to be Oberst or this guy, you know, who's going to like come up with this angle. So we really got to move quick. And, and, you know, also I had this pressure because saves the day was my favorite band. And so I was living on this sort of like Conley um, timetable where they did through being cool when he was like 19 or 20. And then they kind of took off after that. So I was like, oh, man, if I'm not doing it by 20, which is so crazy and stupid and surreal. But it's wild though, because that juice to you did get there. So it's like you kind of needed that for that time. Yeah. It did at the time. You know, I certainly learned a lesson from it. And, and I, I appreciate you looking at it like that. That's how I look at it too. I mean, it's you know, easy from like, it's easy from 20 years later to say like, oh yeah, like that's exactly like that. But you're like, Jesus and, Christ, that was hard. Yeah, and, and but but like you said, I wouldn't be here right now with my kids in this you know in this warm safe house and not you know doing cocaine with the guy from Buddy Head at age, <laughs> at age nineteen. Um, you know, but I had to do that you know um, in order to get here. So 
Yes. <laughs> oh my god. Wait, wait, Travis? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a bit. Yeah, I talked <laughs> I to him, him. He's, he's wild. He's a wild he's dude. Still, he's 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 really good dude. He's still a good dude. Like he was I the thing I sense about those guys dude, Buddyhead was an influence on Israel Boy. Because we were kind of like friends with those people. It was really that was the group of people who were post emo. It was like we were, you know, we all kind of grew up that way and then we're starting to find it funny and annoying. So they were way extreme about that. They were at the point where they were like fucking pissed because they were older. So they were even more embittered. But like we were on the skirting the edge of that. Like, you know, Casper, our first guitar player, was like basically one of those buddy head guys, you know. Um, so we were we were as aware as them of these things. It's just that our whole revolution as we saw it was to go to that people about five years older than us and be like, fuck you, we still like Saves the Day. Like, yeah, we think it's cheesy. Yeah, we can make fun of it and stuff. But, like, we still fucking love it. So, fuck you. It was like the little brother. <laughs> well, they made sense. that Because tr- you you guys start right at that transition. I mean, it literally, it was pop punk in, in the late 90s, Warped Tour, Fat Records. And all of a sudden, it like 2000, literally, on the dot. It just, it, it's like... It's almost this is such a it's it's like it almost like exploded and it went in just like so many different directions you know it's it kind of really like did. this is such a stupid fucking reference but it's almost like the Infinity Stones you know it's like the explosion they all just shot oh, in different that's directions stupid. and all what that. Are you talking to? I love it. <laughs> it's like you know that big bang and it goes it's all different styles so you come in right at that time and see that and then. Like, what was that like to you? Because it seems, from what you're saying, you were, you're not battling it, but you're like, what is this stupid fucking shit? We're going to go I, in I felt, like, uh, embittered and jealous. Because basically, you know, we, we were going to be, like, the starting line. You know, we were, like, going to be one of those bands. And, yeah, we would have had a little bit more sort of self-referential stuff going on because there was that in baseball. That was always kind of my voice. But we would have been more of a, you know, I was like a virgin who had never had a real girlfriend. It would have been a lot different uh, if I had become like a child star of punk, you know. Um, But because it didn't happen, um, I was like, fuck, this sucks. And I like hated college. To some degree, I liked the the people and the experience, but I didn't like what I was seeing. And I'm like, I guess I missed the boat. Now I've got to really figure out what the fuck is going on. So like, my bitterness in life, it wasn't so much hating what I saw, because that is Buddyhead. I think they genuinely could never listen to the starting line and, and would despise them. But I loved the starting line, actually. And I was kind of singing for the people who were like the next generation after it was seen as embitter or seen as shitty, who still liked it, who still like Jimmy World was like the Beatles to us. You know, like I wanted to be honest. Because a lot of the people I saw were flipping and going like, no, we never really liked that shit. We always liked, you know, and that was what it pissed me off so hard, not just on a musical level, but I felt like it was kind of emblematic of society. And it 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 was scary to me. I still feel that way, that I'm a little too keyed into the things that are scary about modern society. Like, I'm like, oh, shit, that's coming. And I'm usually kind of right. And, you know, being that was the thing that scared me about like youth culture. I was like, we're going from like the most eager, soulful, sort of like probably naive type of a narrative for this entire generation where we're like, yeah, and uh, we don't. And then it was like, let's flip the script, introduce cocaine into the situation. Everyone's going to go dark. And I'm like, oh, fuck, this is scary. Like, this is not good. Like shit could go, go real dark if like. Vice magazine takes over the entire world Um, because it really that's what people thought was going to happen. Like people thought the strokes were going to be the Beatles. You know, I saw that being people were like, this is the new rock. And I'm like, yeah, but it's also sus as fuck. And it's just basically a rehash of a bunch of other shit. And it's it's the easy lowest hanging of fruit. So I want to be like, do the less obvious thing, which is to hold on to what was kind of cool. Like you said, it was exploding, but like it was actually we kind of came at the end of that, of when it was credible. Cause right when it fallout boy getting big was right before is a real boy. Really? I'm not talking. Yeah. It was like like, Chicago underground fallout boy. Yeah. Like like, when that got big, it was like absolute punk was already a thing. (laughs) We didn't start playing with, you know, it's not like we came up with, with my chem uh, or, or starting line or any of those bands. We were like, I remember my chem 
being on eyeball and like being at the eyeball offices and we'd be listening to the demos for is a real boy it had not come out yet so everything was still trying to think ahead of all that and this was when like so major labels had started signing all these bands major labels signed taking back sunday and i remember um saves day went to dreamworks it was like this i saw that it was becoming commercialized so whatever i was doing if it was gonna be impactful and be have a real comment on what this meant to society, it would have to take into account that it was already being commercialized. So that leads to like this point. All right. So you, you finish the record and you have all of this like feeling and shit, and then you go through a rough patch, which is yes. you know, pretty, pretty out there. Um, but then yes. you're also at that time. So when Israel boy is done, it's on dog. And I know I talked to Rama and I, I just, Confuse us. So you, it's it's Big Wheel and Doghouse, like in in this album all together. And then, like, what was that whole situation? Because it, it was it was Doghouse, but basically Rama was starting to kind of move more towards management and not so much his label. Like Big Wheel was doing a lot less stuff because um, he was like concentrating on the explosion and just wanting to do stuff outside the box. I think he was <laughs> Rama was, as he said on your interview, he was a huge influence. Um, because we really saw a lot of that in each other. And because he was sort of a lifer who had already toured with Piebald and stuff like that. He was like, how does this kid get this? Because like, I got this, but it was from being on tour with these bands forever. And like, Ram is like a hilarious guy who had like a sort of neurotic, but caring sense of humor. And he's like, it's, he found it really cool that, that there were fans of like the music he put out, like Piebald and Jimmy World, who were as kind of clued into the whole, like the politics of it and wanted to sing about that, you know, cause he, he was annoyed by all that stuff too. And like firsthand, you know, he had worked with Jimmy world. He had worked with all these bands at the drive-in. So he was like, you're right. Like, you know what I mean? He would like introduce me to these bands. He's like, this is what we were talking about. And I'd be like, Whoa, there it is. Like, so we were just kind of like living this bizarre um, meta thing, you know, together. Um, and so, yeah, he really influenced and, and helped me refine and more, more than anything just was very supportive of me as a person, you know, but he was not, it wasn't on big wheel. It was, he was like big wheels doing less dog houses doing more. They're like, they're working with like major labels, all this shit. Cause like that was in their narrative. It was in our narrative from the beginning. I guess the thing is you, you finally get it to happen and shit starts going awry and it's almost, and the record's done. It goes in doghouse. It's like you. Was there a point when things were going bad for you where you were like, before you came out of it, were you like, "Fuck, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose, lose, ho- I'm gonna lose hold of this." No, as sad as it was, my main. Um, it's probably extremely overconfident of me, <laughs> which and is it, great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. honestly, that works though. I think I know people get weirded by that, but you, you have well, to. Well, it was like I think I knew my flaws really well, and I think my, you know, it's it's funny. It's like it's almost the way the world looks at at mental health, you know. And and any everyone has mental health issues. Everyone does. And sometimes when you go, okay, this person's depressed, you mean, oh, this is the kind of guy who's going to like sit in his room and listen to Morrissey a lot. But sometimes the depressed guy is the one who's like out there playing football and, and the, the homecoming king. You know what I mean? So for me, I never lost drive. I never lost the ability to make music. I never got – there were certain things that never changed when, when that all the bipolar stuff was happening. And if anything, this is the real crazy part that I think you and me could probably go off on for like five hours given what you do yeah. and given what this podcast is about. It was, it was a concept record based on the scene – and then when I went, in, but I had no real involvement with it. You know, I was only tangentially, I was like a scene kid. That's it. I was not like, uh, you know, there were people like like Travis who were like fully in it. Like they had done things, you know, Rama had put out records. I was just like their little brother. I was like this 19 year old kid who hung around, and like smoked their weed. And they're like, oh, there's cute little Max. Like he likes your meat world. Huh? And so like when I was bipolar, when I was bipolar, when I was manic, I like the way my mania works is it starts to take that metaphorical meta uh, allegorical way of looking at life and it literalizes it. So like, this is the craziest thing. So like I'm walking around Brooklyn and this is probably after record before recording admitted, but recording the rest of the record. Cause that's when I have my first like episode and I heard, you know, and by the way, this wasn't audible. I don't have schizophrenia, so I don't hear voices, but like, 
I was sort of like conjuring Enoch and Conway. And so like, I was kind of like, if these are the things that you think when you're like on acid or on shrooms, yeah. that's what, that's what being manic is. Like people don't necessarily know that, but that is the experience when you're truly manic. He's like, you're like, Oh yeah, I am Jesus. If I had just known that this whole time, <laughs> fuck yeah, I would have been chill. You know? So I was like, Enoch is talking to me. I got Conway and they're like, you're the next dude, you know? And I'm like, Oh, it makes sense. Cause like, I'm singing about this. That's what I was intending. You know what I mean? It, it's all coming together. And I, it wasn't like, there was no sign that this record was going to do what I wanted, but it was so intentional. Everything was intentional to the point where I was like hearing in my head. It's like, and so basically it, it actualized and that's what made it kind of difficult. And to this day, a difficult thing to be the kind of person who was born into out of pure luck, a situation. You can be someone in Ohio who's, you know, bipolar and having a manic episode and thinking you're going to be the next Jeremy Enoch. It's like, I'm sorry, it's, it, it sucks, but it's not going to happen. But because I was born into whatever the exact circumstances that got me there at that exact moment, it lined up with my mental illness. And so that extreme ambition and my exposure to the entertainment industry and proximity to the scene you know, it was perfect for someone who had like a messiah complex, and I was already making fun of the messiah complex. It was just so meta on so many levels. Yeah, so meta. <laughs> but but it was just crazy because then those things would happen. You know, it was really, and, and that's why I've had to keep it even more together. Is like even to this day, the craziest shit ever will happen to me. I mean, I've had stuff happen to me even in the past couple of weeks where it's like it could be out of a movie in terms of the. Um, synergy and that's everyone's life though that's everyone's life it's just on this is on a sort of cheesy um entertainment uh scale um so it seems more wild than everyday life where you run into your ex-girlfriend and she's with this guy who's like oh my god this is a thing that my dad was doing and it matches up perfectly and then your life is a movie for a second you know and so for me it was it was just happened to play out you know, like on the cover of like alternative press you know it was like, yeah you all, I mean, that's also too. I like I. I did not get into this to, to pick that whole thing apart, like to talk no, about. It, I I know it. it's gonna, no, I okay. mean, it's, it's for me. It's more about what it. First of all, there's no. You know, there's everyone should be able to pick it apart. You know, it's like it's. It was such a big thing. It was. It was a thing I communicated openly about. Yeah. Um, and I find it interesting. You know, I find it interesting in myself. Like I dissect it. It's if you're healthy, you know, and if you have a good head on your shoulders and have humility. You can dissect these weird fucking things about your mental illness and be like, that's funny or that's weird or that's so cool. You know, like it's like it's a fucking science project. Well, it's it's kind of interesting, though, because like I'm a huge fan of and I talk about this a lot and I don't know if people think it's weird, but like I'm a big manifester, like, you know, the law of attraction and things like that. Yeah, I think it's like it's almost like and this is a giant leap, but maybe if you if your perception from where yes. you were at at that time is so aggressively because i mean that's the way it manifested works it's like you have to literally live in it and believe it and that's what makes it work maybe that like that openness that you have and had then very strongly maybe i mean this is so out there but it probably pulled it you know Dude, that's like it, it pulled it like big it. No, time you got it that's it yeah so essentially my mental illness as it's understood you know in which i, I think it's a weird term helped me with manifesting and it's always helped me with manifesting because you you just really believe it, it. gives you yeah and but here's the thing that i think and again this could again i think we could probably go off forever because i am all about manifesting yeah is like i think we all have it we oh 100 100 you know totally so, so basically everyone has some key to that manifesting which when you Use it wrongly is the thing that makes people go nuts or become evil. <laughs> yeah. And then when you use it rightly, it, it gives you the, the spirit to, to make your dreams come true. And so bipolar in particular, that exact mood disorder, it's almost like, as I said, you know, I've done comics about this because it's, it is like superheroes. You know, you all have different strengths. Mine was like, I can stay up. I can have this boundless um, energy and focus and look at things from a huge sort of perspective, you know, those are my things. Cause it's like, that's the same quality that makes this one homeless guy think that aliens have taken him away and yeah. that, you know, that he's the guy who's like, you know, going to save the president from being assassinated. So I happen to be in the right place, right time where I actually knew I could use these kind of things to do something with them. Otherwise I wouldn't have, I didn't see myself as powerless in that situation. You know, I was like, Oh, this is kind of just makes sense with the whole thing. 
<laughs> you know, I was like, I didn't know I was bipolar, but when they told me, I'm like, okay, I'm like, uh, yeah, mentally ill, um, sort of Kurt Cobain type kid, like makes sense. Of course I am. You know, like in the story that you would make up about the singer of Say Anything, if I was writing this musical, it made sense. So I never had shame because like you had people like Elliot Smith, Kurt Cobain, everyone was, you know, it wasn't, I would like to think that maybe I was explicitly honest about it in a way that some people had not been, but it was coming out around that time that instead of it being this uh, demon, demonized thing, it was commonplace. It was like, oh yeah, um, who's the dude uh, from Austin? Uh, like the songwriter, I'm like, I literally am an old man because he's like one of the most famous indie songs, whatever. Like it was a, it was a common thing. It's just, it was like a little under the Wait, I have to know this. I have to know the fuck that you're talking about now. Um, <sighs> you know what I mean? Like, oh God, it's, he's ubiquitous. Bon Iver? No, he's like a cute guy. It's like, literally, we're going to say it's going to be like, it's like neutral milk. It's like neutral milk level. Like there's graffiti with his name on it. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 people are probably yelling this right now. If they're listening oh God. Yeah. Like this is like when I forget my kids' names, <laughs> it really, it's one of those situations where I, my mind knows that I blanked. It's like forgetting the word confident. Yeah. That's fine. No, it's, 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 a, it's totally irrelevant. <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, and now I'm not gonna be able to stop thinking about it, but the point was like, I knew that it could be utilized for some good. Yeah. And so I kind of fed into it and that was dangerous. Um, but I learned my lesson there. I was like, okay, well, that's the only time I got to do it because this is like my first, it's my debut thing. And if I'm making fun of an artist making their first record, you know, and, and the amount of ambition that goes into a first record, it's a good, it's a fitting ending to it is that, you know, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't think you're Jesus. You shouldn't. I guess that was like, that was like kind of my point because it's all in your hands and then, you know, things start kind of getting away from you where it wasn't you that wasn't going to make it happen. It was your surrounding, like your yeah, label yeah, and the yeah, people being like, oh, we, we push him back and you're like, no, no, just stick with me. They're like, eh, and you're like, fuck. Yeah, exactly. And that's honestly a lot of people's experience in life. It, you know, if you are that kind of a person, I'm sure you are. If, if you believe in, Honestly, if you believe in manifesting and things like that, you're always going to be a little bit, you could say ahead or behind, you know, sort of norms, you could call them, who just kind of like are, and, and, and I don't mean bad, like there are some people who can live in it and some people who are always thinking about it. And they're both equally important. You know, it doesn't make one better or smarter. They're both revolutionary, revolutionary in their own ways. In fact, like, Two Tongues was a play on that. It was like, Chris is someone who can live in the moment. I'm someone who's always thinking about the moment. So, you know, you, but you have to lean into it and accept that about yourself. Um, if you're someone who manifests by thinking really hard, you know, those are the same qualities that you might be a depressed person in high school because you're looking around and everyone's kind of fucking off and you're like, why don't you guys see this? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so, so totally, it, it, totally. That's what you're describing is, is that, yeah, the people around me kind of were like, we don't get some people like we don't get it. Some people were like, we do get it, but you got to slow down. Like Andrew, my booking agent, who I think you've talked about quite a bit, you know, he was like, he said to them, he was like, um, He's like, you've got to like let people catch up, because like if if you if you do it too hard, you just get put in jail. <laughs> like there's there's nothing. <laughs> like society's too fucked up. You have to kind of, if you want to make a positive difference, you can't run into the street and like be like fuck everything. We're taking it all down. Like you just tend to get put away and snuffed out. But you can make a big difference if you think about where people are coming from, where the people who may not have man be thinking about it as much are coming from. So, so everything I've done has been some attempt to communicate it to the people who don't necessarily pick up on it immediately. Okay. So I could stay on that the whole time and I love where that went. <laughs> yeah, it's I know. So, great. Right. <laughs> so yeah, like it's an analyst. Well, wow. that the record comes out and did it just completely blow the fuck up or did it take time? to catch on i think it, it it was somewhere in the middle you know what i mean for me for indie label standards it blew the fuck up you know like we um we were like did the big spot on uh skate and surf which became bamboozle the year that we showed up and it was like i remember andrew going it's like this is a spot that like brand new god and taking back sunday when they were getting big so now it's you <laughs> i'm like really fuck um, so I think that is kind of what happened. You know, we were the next one of those bands, but, you know, then there's another one and there's another one and there's another one. And I knew kind of that 
you know, I wanted to kind of escape that cycle, that narrative. Um, so we did sign to a bigger label um, and they re-released the record. So basically they took, they capitalized on it being sort of a big indie success yes. and then went for it trying to be, you know, a gigantic, and honestly it wasn't like it was big. It was a successful record enough for us to be considered successful and have a whole career off of it. But it wasn't obviously as big as like dude ranch by blink 182. You know, it wasn't, it didn't set, it didn't like go gold or anything. Well, until... kind of like the, it was like Deja and I can never say that fucking yes. brand name. It was like, it was like that. It was so it, uh, underground yes, yes. level. Everyone pretty much owned that record. Mm-hmm. And when, yeah, when, it, when it was J that. records put it back out, that's when I got it because I remember it was, then think... it was like, wow, I can get sexual video. There were things that were actually kind of mainstream that happened you know, scrubs, weird things where we sort of poked into the, you know, the pop spectrum. Um, and that, I think that does people like you hearing about it. I mean, but you were already kind of a lifer, a little lifer at that point. You know, it's like, but the fact that it became kind of ubiquitous, like Fallout Boy or something, you're like, yeah, you, you, people would be like, all right, I'll give this a shot. Because it's like, I can't stop hearing about it. You know, people are plugging it. Like, I remember telling my buddy Sean, Sean Bergen, if he's listening, he, he, for years, he would, he was like, fuck that band. Yeah, I don't want to listen to that bullshit. That. And I was like, dude, trust me. I know I was I'm that there. Guy too. I, yeah, I was like, dude, I was like, I didn't want to listen to Take Back Sunday when I bought their first record. I didn't take it out of my player for like years. And I was like, this is the same thing as this record. I'm like, trust me. And then years later, he was like, dude, yeah, that fucking record owns. I was like, fuck, I told you. Like, yeah, but a I lot of people the, were fighting it. it, though. They were, they, everyone was like really fighting it. And, but I remember that too, because um, I could be sexual. So the same buddy, the same buddy that I, I keep talking about, like his wife, Jess, uh, so my buddy, John Price, he's the one who introduced me to like you guys. And he's, so it, when I, when, while I could be sexual came out, we were like living in Hoboken. He's like, dude, you got to hear this song. It's hilarious and amazing. And, and that's what like, got, I think that's what led me down that path to like finding you guys. And I was like, what the fuck is this song is great. And so then like, thank you, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like that's a good way of looking at it too. Like it wasn't that it was necessarily the poppiest song we had. It was that it was blatantly separated us from, you know, taking that Sunday, you know, where it was completely serious, basically, totally. you know, that's cool that that's what you picked up on. So that's, that's really, I've never thought of that song that way. I just think of it as our most commercial song. Cause yeah, when you hear the rest of our songs, they're all like that. But if you think about that being the gateway to to our band, then the label is actually really smart. And the people that work with us to know that, Oh, someone's going to hear that and be like, what the fuck is uh-huh. this? Like, this <laughs> yeah, that's what, I, that's exactly what I like. If you could think of like a marketing funnel system where someone's yeah, like, this is where yeah. you click and it bring it down. I was that person. So it's like, you have that happen. So you, 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 you get picked up by the label by uh, J Records, so it's like, all right, cool. Now this thing's alive again, or it's it's gonna keep moving. You get that single coming out, and then you guys are, and then like you go, you definitely have gone through like a bunch of members. But yes, Kobe or um, Co- Kobe. Kobe, right? yes. One of the best fucking drummers, by the way, I've ever heard. Oh my god, ridiculous! Life. That ridiculous. guy is stupid. So he's so good. So it's like, you know, you're going through members and and all this stuff. So it's like, it seems like it's constantly been this. It's never, I don't know, there's ever a point where I saw it look like it was packaged and tight for an extended period of time was the was the self-titled record. But prior to that, it seemed like it was jumbled. Yeah, I think it was it was it was it was uh, self-consciously jumbled. And then there was an attempt to package it, and then we just let it become jumbled again. Because you know, technically people blew the fuck up most about the jumble is what's funny. Yes. You know, it's like, 100%. I'm really proud that, um, to me, self-titled, and it's so funny, that's another actualization thing, is like, when we were making self-titled, I wasn't just thinking of trying to reference like American Idiot or like Dookie or these, you know, um, dude, Enema of the State, like basically the big major label debut that sounds perfect and, has the big, you know, that it was self-consciously that. But I also was was referencing failed attempts to do that, like the Super Drag album, Head Trip and Every Key. And like, just it doesn't matter if it actually is a hit or not, just the sound of a band that is fully confident and thinks they can have a hit. <laughs> you know, so like, that's what we were keying into. And because we only had like a tiny, tiny hit, it didn't, definitely didn't do what they wanted it to do. It, it wasn't the next Green Day. You know, it was, but in the pantheon, ew, an annoying word of like our, 
records, I'm really happy that it just, it's in there. It's actually one of the more popular records. It's not like with certain other bands, the, the attempt at popularity is the worst record or is seen as the worst record. And maybe it has a resurgence or whatever. It's like this whole narrative, but we didn't really have that. And I'm really happy that there's, you know, that, that, that you had it in your wedding and stuff. It's like, it was a real record. You know, those songs were not written to be hit songs. They were, but they weren't written to be hit songs. They were about my life and they were super personal. Um, so the fact that it sits in our sort of discography um, and that, you know, putting on the suits and all that, like, it doesn't feel that weird. You know, whereas you look at certain other bands and when they tried to be popular, it seems completely out of, you know what I mean? It's like, let's put them in suits. Like, you know, like there's a certain era of Taking Back Sunday where like, you know, they had the same thing and it's like, let's dress them like the Strokes for a little bit and try to get it. You know, it's like, or, or you know, like NFG with that one album, like dressing like uh, whatever. And you're just like, whoa, look at this weird moment. And then you, they go back to being normal. So I knew that's probably what was going to happen. Again, it was kind of manifested. I was like, the chances of us being the next Green Day are low. I'm like, I want to be. I'm going to do everything we can to be. But come on, that's why guys end up working at Guitar Center on the Sunset Strip for their entire lives. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to take the time to make the best sounding record. So if we become just kind of like the next Built to Spill instead of the next Green Day, I'll have this amazing record. And um, that's what, thank God, I think it ended up doing based on people like you actually liking it that much. Oh, I love that record. Like, I think the funniest thing, though, is when uh, Hate Everyone came out. And that's when, so I saw the video. And I saw like you guys had uniforms, and I heard the song. And I first heard it, I was like, "What the fuck is this?" And I was just like, "Oh, they went in a different direction." But then when I heard it with the record, I was like, "Oh, yes. that makes total fucking sense." Sometimes there's like that song, like there was an Alkaline Trio song when they got signed mm, to Vagrant. Oh, time to waste. No, uh, no. Actually, uh, I fuck, I fucking like that. No, it was before Crimson. Me too. When they got signed to, and uh, that's anyone didn't. Vagrant. But, but you totally didn't. You obviously hate Alkaline Trio. No, I'm just kidding. No, uh, they, <laughs> when they got signed to Vagrant, they had Vagrant put out a compilation before they released all the records. Yeah, it was like yeah. Saves the Day, Get Up Kids, crawl, all that. Crawl with the with the piano at the end. <laughs> yes. Like, yeah. 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 Well, there was out like, of contact. It, uh, what the fuck? No, it wasn't. It wasn't crawl. It was like some other some other song where it was at, it was on Bloody the compilation. I it think those were those two. It, and, it might have been and, Bloody. Yeah, they up. were popular. And I, but I heard it. I heard it. And I was like. Oh, this song sucks. But then I heard it in the album, and I was like, "Oh my god, I love this song." That was like the same thing that happened to me with this record. And then I listened to the whole thing. I was like, "I love this this, oh, this fucking record. It's so dope." Thank you. But Thank um, you. but yeah, I just had to be honest and be like, "Yeah, when I heard that song, I was like, I was like, what the fuck is this shit?" And then I was like, "Oh my god, it makes sense." Dude, that's what we're doing as a band. You know, I think I think we would be remiss in in not admitting that you know everything that the band has kind of ever done has been to kind of put people off. And then have them kind of a second later go, wait a second. It's like my very voice on Is a Real Boy is like kind of a dare to keep listening. You know, it's like, it's not like you get on there and it's like, you know, even like Mark Hoppus or something where I think it's closer to DeLong. Where like, I remember the first time I heard like Josie or something and you're like, or no, no, that's, that's Mark. What is like Apple the first big, or something, or? no, there was, there was a, oh no, he was Josie. Cause he sings the chorus. That yeah. was the first time. Cause I, I heard about Blink for the first time through dude ranch. And I remember him coming in on the chorus. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was like, so like annoyed and angered, but now he's like, fuck, I, I back Tom. I, like, I don't, he's like my, one of my favorite singers, not just like for being like his voice, particularly. So I think there is something to kind of risking jumping the shark at all times, but not. Um, or some people would even argue that we have or that you that he has or that anyone has who kind of is very like, I don't know, willing to take risks. Yeah, 100 percent. So I was just I'm, so I'm, I know we just completely just jumped over in defense of the genre, which like a, like the shark, the proverbial shark. But but that one wouldn't be the shark. I think technically, like anarchy, my dear, would be the shark. <laughs> that meant for yeah, but they actually survived the jump. Yeah, because that went way back to the theatrics of is a real boy, but like went just dove into the theatrics. Exactly, like, it's a lot exactly. less. It's a lot lighter. Like then, it's, there's the heaviness is like taken out. Yes. Oh yeah. And we were we were so confused at that point. And also though, it's also one of those less um, records I can go back and listen to and really enjoy a lot. Some of them I was so 
obsessed with that I know every tiny guitar part and I know every mixing stroke that one I let it come out more like eh, whatever and you know that had a good effect and a bad effect because to me that record more so sealed our status as we could have just been a one of those bands like ugh, and I feel bad saying it but like because they could still be a band and I really don't want to use it but like story of the year um, we're, you know, but those guys I know went on to have other careers in different bands and were very talented. That said, when you say story of the year, you think they had that one hit song and then they kind of disappeared. And there were a lot of bands or like, like who that would that, stank or some shit like that. Yeah. Or, but even more so like the bands that like had three out, like boy sets fire where it's like, they had like a bunch of really great indie records, then an attempt at major label success and then fully fell off, fell apart or just quit. You know, so it's like that was the narrative. And I think, thank God, um, Anarchy, my dear, was the one where I'm like, look, you either have to be in it and see us as a fucking real band that you're going to go with some of the weirder shit we do or the more uh, reserved things. Like, we're not going to make another huge, gigantic sounding record, nor are we going to make another attempt to be like emo. I just basically made what I was listening to at the time, which was like, you know, a lot of uh, Japan droids and. Stuff like that, you know, so it was like, I'm, I want to make a fucking casual ass record right now. <laughs> I'm going to go with the normal producer. A hundred percent. Yeah. Ca it's very casual. It's very like chill. And to do admit it again, did you like kind of second guess if you should do that or not? Or Yes, of course. I mean, but I second guess everything. I second guess the first admit it. You know, I mean, I second guess everything. If anything, I like. I second guess everything, but I have more of a propensity to actually do shit than most people. Like I, considering the amount of second guessing that I actually end up doing it anyway, I think is kind of the the divide. Um, Cause most people are like, that's kind of crazy. I think I'm going to avoid that. I'm like, yes, I've thought about it. It's yeah. You're like, I have to do this now. Yeah. Now, now that I've thought this. of it and I know it's a bad idea, I should really do it. So yeah, that was something like that where it was very self-referential where it's like, of course people would want admit it again and it was like seen as it, like i wanted it to be obvious that like we had this sort of like commercial misfire and so i'm trying to grasp by hiring like you know the same producer from is a real boy and doing admit it again so everything was like a commentary on itself but do you think like you doing that almost kind of full circles in some way it's like you became the thing you were kind of making fun of but then it like worked kind of but then you're like fuck i've been that person now yeah because because honestly from the beginning i was more so look like you can you can be very clear from this interview if there was an actual trajectory per se anything specific like me as a person whole other story because as you know it's like comics are a part of it being having a family i i don't i can't define myself that way but in terms of saying anything, just that specific musical project, which is why it's on hiatus, it did have this exact trajectory, which it actually did everything I wanted to and what was I was making fun of, like what you're saying. But I was like romanticizing Modest Mouse, um, Trio, bands that basically had a big song or had an attempt to make a big song, didn't make it, but then became a career band, Bad Religion. That, that's what I wanted in the end for saying anything. Even when I was 15, like even when I was 15, I was like, I don't necessarily want to be blink. Green Day was maybe a better example because they also fell off. Like I wanted to fall off. And when I got in the moment, I was like, oh, of course, I'm going to do everything I can to try to make a billion dollars and do what the record label wants me to do. But I'm going to complain about it and make it self-conscious the entire time, <laughs> like you said, to almost make it happen. Yeah. Um, you know, because in defense, in and of itself was like, fuck you, I'm going to make a double album because like I should make a hypey album that's going to play into it was punk. It was it was essentially punk. The, the band is a very punk project that was is an attempt to anger people to make them feel good about themselves or think about something that's positive. But it's it's through anger, defiance and that kind of shit doing what's opposite of what's supposed to be good. Um, and it, it still is that to me because the new project I'm working on now is the opposite of that. And that's, it's positive. It's everything is, it's like, you have to keep it positive. You have to keep it positive. I think they're both important. You know, you don't have to not have punk in your life. I think you, you know, your podcast is a great example of that. Like nostalgia is a great thing, you know, and punk doesn't have to be only nostalgic because we still need both of those. That's why people still 
put on these records. That's why we're still listening to the Get Up Kids and we're like middle aged. Yeah. Because it's like you, you still need that. You know, you need that defiance, and you also need acceptance. Well, so, it kind of like know, it, it kind of like brings out like I, like when the pandemic started. I was driving around, obviously, because I had jack shit to do, and I put on Alkaline Trio. I put on um, it wasn't God Damn It. Um, it wasn't Maybe I Catch Fire. It was the uh, the third record from here to infirmary. He, from here to infirmary. Yeah, I, I put that on and. I became like that. I, I heard it from my 18 year old ears again, you know, and I was like, oh, my God, this is so awesome. And then, you know, then it, I can only do it a couple times. And I'm like, all right, then nostalgia, it wears out fast. But that isn't nostalgia. You know, that's not necessarily nostalgia, because when I listen to some things, it evokes nostalgia. Like I can put on certain things from the 90s, maybe like 90s, old, like like fucking lit <laughs> oh, <laughs> and yeah. be like, ha, yeah. ha, I remember when this was good, but it's still kind of good. <laughs> like there's an irony to it. But a lot of the times with like this kind of music, I put it on and it's like, like you said, you're right back there because there's stuff that's going on right now in your life that it's applicable to. And that's that's what I think about this scene is so special. You know, it's like I always knew it would end up like this to some degree. I'm not saying I, I could forecast exactly how it did it or that. There, I think a lot of people did. You probably did. And that's why we all had the same sense of humor about it. But it was marginalized by people. Um, everyone kind of knew what was going to happen with these bands, you know, oh, they're going to get signed to a major label, then they're going to get dropped, and they're going to sign to Vagrant, then they're going to blah, blah, blah. Like, it's the whole thing. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'm here for it, <laughs> you know? Um, well, which scene do you think is your scene personally? The late 90s or, the, like, the early 2000s? No, or early 2000s. I think we were the bridge. I, I think we were one of the bridge bands, if oh, not, yeah. like, kind of the definitive one because we were commenting on it, and we weren't the biggest band in either scene, you know, like... To me, I think it's, you know, saves a, day, you have one, saves a day on one side and you've got like Mike Hem on the other side. Hmm. And then, you know, almost us and Fall Out Boy, I think Fall Out Boy being the more poppy equivalent, we're commenting on it. You know, like that's why I really liked Fall Out Boy and I like Pete's songwriting because it was like, it was meta. He's commenting on how people thought he was a singer. <laughs> like, you know, we were like, this is whack. Like, look at these bands around us in the scene that are getting signed. And it's a whole, it's a whole, we're now being monetized. And so there was a, there was a comment on that moment where it was transitioning to being basically the idea of emo, which was bleeding heart romanticism. You know, it was kind of a new thing in punk and in conceptually, like sort of in the counterculture. And then it got like bought and used, you know, so we were basically saying that. Um, watch out for that. <laughs> did you ever? Did you ever feel at some point you could take the record labels because you knew they were using you? Did you try at some point to flip and be like, "All right, we're going to start using you"? Well, yeah, I think the whole. Th I I think the difference between me and a lot of people I know, in period in life and especially in bands, is like, I never thought that was dark. You know, like what the fuck else are they going to do? That's what they are there for. They're a literal corporation. You know, if you look at a corporation as like a living thing, it must subsist on the blood of, <laughs> of, of the people. That is what it does. I don't believe in corporations existing for that reason. But since I have to operate in reality and not spend my life in a mental hospital, kind of as we were saying before, if they're going to exist, why would I go into that situation and sign to a major label and have that typical experience of like, do you want me to write a hit? It's like, no fucking shit. Why'd you sign to a major label? Yeah. You know, that was that was the issue I had with like the, the Cobain narrative, even though I adore Nirvana. Um, and I think they were a special, beautiful band. It's like, you know, because he admittedly was saying he wanted them to be the biggest band in the world. When it happened, he was not prepared for it. And he was like, this is hip hypocrisy. You know, like this is hypocrisy. Punk can't be like this. But it's like, yeah, but when it was a joke, you wanted it to be like that. You secretly want it to be Aerosmith. And then now that you are Aerosmith, you're going to try to play too cool for it. So that was what I think we were trying to comment on and be like, look how hypocritical this is and yet special. You know what I mean? Like, and yet worth it. So, so yeah, I feel like we used them, but they were using us and there was nothing bad about that. That's the nature of like when you're walking by someone playing guitar on the street and you give them a fucking quarter, you're using each other, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, it's positive. I, you know, I don't see anything negative in that sort of natural give and take of humanity. I don't like capitalism, but at the same time, like, why can't both sides get what they want? Is kind of how I always looked at it. Yeah, I mean, it's like you, it's like you signed up for it. You got to take ownership of it. You know. Yeah, and and they want us to be, they want us to be successful. We want to be successful. What's wrong with it? You know, like, yeah, we're gonna take their money, and they 
literally knew when they signed us, everyone involved with the band got the joke. You know what I mean? Like you could, like you said, you could, they used Wow, I Can't Sexual. You couldn't market our band without understanding that we knew the whole thing was a joke. So, you know, like they knew that we knew and therefore we, it was a really good relationship. I have pretty much good relationships with everyone I've ever worked with in music because there never was this attempt to be like realer than real and like, oh yeah, you're not accepting me. It's like, you know, I, I just feel like I've always been made fun of myself because more people should. Yeah. I mean, yeah, hundred percent. So I think like the one thing I love, there's these little things about this podcast that I love and I say this all the time, but like even the story about you in the car with your dad, something for, for 15 years where I've been like, what the fuck was that? And I find it out now through this. I'm like, this is so cool. Like this is something I didn't know why that I wanted was going to get out of this podcast. Oh God. We, we are a novel full of those. Like if any band in the scene, we actually, every band in the scene is like that, as you have found by interviewing, but like, just because of that whole irony element, there were so many things like that, those weird stories of this happening. Coincidentally, this person was there and it ended up being the person from this. Like that's almost the most definitive thing about our band. It was constant, it was constant. So I'm like looking back and you go from, and I'm gonna wrap this up soon, but like you go from being, you wanna be this, as a young kid, 15 years old, like I'm gonna contact drive through, I want this career. So like, you get that. You get to record um, "Is a Real Boy." You get to fucking write a record with Chris from Saves the Day, who's like your hero. So it's like all these things happen. Was there anything that you wanted from day one when you were fifteen to have happen as this band that didn't happen? I would say prop. I would say the one thing is maybe we wanted but weren't didn't need like a trl number one level success like that's all like we didn't necessarily want to be the of like uh teen heartthrobs or like really make a lot of money that was never what we wanted but we would have taken being the next foo fighters you know what i mean we would have taken being the next weezer so i think we wanted that and it didn't happen that said we kind of knew from the beginning it probably wouldn't happen it was what kind of I think that self-awareness was really important to the band in terms of keeping us humble and defining what we'd sing about. Because like you said, it was actualization. Like we're like, okay, we're going to hedge our bets because like we are, maybe we're good enough or catchy enough or whatever. We have what it takes to be the next big, 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 big number one band in the world. But we'd rather address the sort of underdogs or we'd rather address what the process is of wanting that because in life, we're all trying to be number one, you know what I mean? At whatever we're doing. And uh, by definition, you're going to fail. By definition, there's always someone doing better or doing something different. Even, you know, you listen to Dave Grohl's book, which is amazing. Um, and What's it's that, it's what? literally, uh, it's, yeah. oh, he has a book called oh, well. The Storyteller. Okay. It's fucking amazing. It's a listen to it. It's so good. Like the audio book, he does the audio book. Okay. And when I listen to it, it's the most uncanny thing of he being a lot like me than any other famous person. <laughs> it's the most intense thing. And, and I'm like, how could you feel that way? Like you're Dave fucking girl. You listen to it and you're like, of course he feels that way. And so I feel like if you're, if you're straight up going for number one at all times without a knowledge that you're going to end up there and then you're going to be sad and then you're going to wish you weren't number one, like that whole thing is a big part of it. So I think we knew we would have burnt out. I think we knew if we were given that, it wouldn't have worked. Well, when did you know, like, because, like, when was, I think, um, 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 um my God, um, Oliver Appropriate, because you, you basically put that out as a, like, a, this is it, like, um, or this is it for the moment or whatever it's going to be. So, like, what led to you to finally go on, you know what, man, I think I'm, I think I'm good at closing the door on this for a minute. It was just the sheer case. It was what I knew it was going to, it was when I could have become that character because I never was, you know, I never was, I was always, as you said, wide eyed, pretty innocent. You know, my band had never turned on each other. Um, you know, I never didn't enjoy shows. I had never been addicted to a drug. I was very, very happily married and had kids. You know, there were all these things that I got away with and was very, those were the things that I needed to live. And then there was probably some part of me that was like, like you said, wanted to be, to do something really cool or different, you know, always striving to, to get, there. that was kind of a narrative of a lot of these bands. Um, every band before Corona was like, get back on tour, go keep selling records, keep going. And I was like, okay, I guess that's what I'm doing. Okay. You get caught up in it and you just never stop. 
Um, and I had already made the record and it was this comment on the Israel boy character. It was like, I wanted to show people I was not that character by illustrating, I'm a happy guy. I'm not self-destructive. I'm not misogynistic. Even though people think every emo singer is, I'm not, you know, just because brand new did this doesn't mean we are. <laughs> and it was a comment on that. It was literally a comment on that me too moment. Um, and I was like, Right when I realized I was kind of self-destructing by doing a comment on it, it was just like is a real boy. I was like, that's what I was doing then. I was self-destructing by doing a commentary on self-destruction. So I'm like, okay, full circle, we're done. You know, like I don't need to go further into this now. Yeah, that's it's good to know. Like, I mean, it's hard to stop something, especially when you have it's got legs. Right. Could have been a sitcom that went on too long. <laughs> yeah, and especially when there's when there's you know a financial connection to it as well. You know that's like your it's your livelihood, and that's the one thing. And especially a hard thing as a musician is you get to a point if you've been a band for so long, you're probably thinking, well, fuck, this is what I need to do. And then luckily you have branched off and done like the comic and you're writing songs. Like a lot of people don't do that. Yeah, and and just like family was always really important. You know, I didn't socially i was never that the funny thing is ironically it's like you know some people would probably who know who i am would think of me as sort of a uh you know either a weird outlier or you know the most ultimate scene person ever because i tend to come up in a lot of these conversations and i'm you know like you said but anyone who really knows me knows i was never really that if anything i don't i never went to like the parties i was never you know, a, a, a lifer in that way. You know what I mean? I was kind of like a weird outlier of the whole thing, but I was also like a big fan. Well, in the defense of the genre is such a, I mean, that's, and not to keep right, there you go. That's such a that's such a point out of you being like, I'm not a part of this whole like thing. I was this is about like me being awkward. Thank you for taking it that way. I mean, some because some people literally took that as he's the guy. He's the guy. He's saying this is amazing. He's saying this is the best thing of all time. And I was saying genres are bullshit like if you're gonna say that this is a genre listen to all these cool people who do completely different stuff and you're just putting them under one thing it doesn't exist um and and if it does exist it's not that bad you know as opposed to and like i hate the idea that it's being marginalized i hate the idea like what does this stupid word mean it doesn't mean anything to all these you know things of music so it was both of those things there's a sincerity in the, the what those songs were about and the fact that i had like Haley sing on it you know like that's just sincerity that's what everyone else in these bands was doing but then there was also just going but yet this is very a surreal weird thing isn't it you know like it's not it's not just something that i can go with and suddenly be like the king of the scene like i really i think stepped out of that very i thought very, as you, you were like sharing like you were it wasn't like hey everyone come under me i thought you were like hey you and you and you like come here and let's all do this as a team not as like one yes. of us as the coach or anything or like exactly. the main player yeah yeah and it was like the kinsella thing where like i got into a scrap with Tim kinsella on absolute punk like that was the dumbest thing ever wait you what know, was that? i just well it was just hilarious it was one of those things that you would talk about on this podcast it was like he came out and said something really annoying and pretentious about emo music, uh, where he's like, and, and but just dismissed everything after Captain Jazz, basically. And then I kind of came back with something publicly like, like you're a self-loathing emophobe. Like I'm like, you created it. Like I was like, dude, look, like you are everything you hate. Um, and I just wanted to be a punk about it. And he came back and was like, this guy's defending the scene. Like he's like has to look out for. It. I'm like, no, I just think you're like being a hypocrite in general, bro. Like you're really like smart funny guy i love your music you know it's like i just think that basically you know it needed some of that energy like it was still awesome i love paramore like i still do and yet i also wanted to say i love paramore and it's cool to like paramore even though a lot of people are saying it's not cool but at the same time i also really like these weird bands on discord you know so like you should listen to this weird other music too yeah so okay, I am gonna I'm gonna wrap this up, even though I could literally I could fucking talk to you all night. Um, I'm with you. <laughs> before okay, so before I ask the last two questions, is there any? I've been asking this lately. Is there any like w story that you've wanted to tell that you had never got a chance to in an interview, or like this is like a really funny story of like I always I don't know I I always wanted to tell this. Story. Well, a really good. It's a very short story, but it's a very apt one. And because you had Rama on the show, I think you'll understand this even more was uh there was a so we were all like we all used to hang out at rama's house and i was like the little brother 
and we would all just hang out and smoke weed. These dudes were like five years older than me, and we would just laugh the whole time. And um, keep in mind that Rama in me, it was like this back and forth there um, of just who could get more into this concept of kind of loving and making fun of emo at the same time. And him being like the big brother who liked it before it was cool, me being the little brother who clearly liked it too late. He's like, he, you know, like he would make fun of me for liking like newer newfound glory. I would make fun of him for being like a dinosaur about the whole thing. <laughs> um, you know, so it was that it was this really funny, cool dynamic between us and um, a bird. <laughs> a random bird went and flew into his window and died immediately when hitting the window. And he just looked at me and he's like, he did an impression of me. And I, this isn't even a story, but it's just such an emblematic of, of is a real boy and stuff. And he's like. Max is like, the bird is emo music. Like that was be, would be my re reaction to this random bird flying into the thing. <laughs> he completely captured that I was just trying to make everything into a metaphor about emo music. So it was like, <laughs> the bird is emo music is really what I was like at age 19, just sitting there with a bong being like, whoa, dude, it's like Chris Conley is exactly like the dude from Zeppelin. And yet it's this philosophical. So he just like completely crunched it in one, one diss. And it was nice. <laughs> <laughs> the bird is emo music. It's like, that's my entire career encapsulated. I love it. Cause hopefully I, I, I think if he sees that you're on, he's going like, to, <laughs> yeah, I hope he listens to it for sure. Um, actually love you in real quick. <laughs> Real quick, do you, um, Amy, so I, I interviewed Amy and she told a story about how you walked up to her one time and you were like, hey, um, I would have been on your label. And she was like, what? And you're like, yeah, I would have, was that, what was that? Where was that? Dude, that was something I, as a fucking little kid would do often. It was like, you know, when you're like in a band and you have any kind of success and all you want to do is kind of tell someone who thought you wouldn't make it that uh -huh. you did yeah so i was kind of making fun of that and i would do it to everyone who tried to who who had a chance at signing us and didn't so i told Gurowitz, you know i'm like 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 i think i was like you know we really you missed the boat or like joe escalante <laughs> oh um that was like my thing i would call them out on it because it's like this awkward dynamic when you meet them and you know that they almost signed you and then you're getting success it's like there, there's always like this oh look good for you good for you moment um, but actually she's amazing and we had never met, so it was different. But I, I, I also, cause she came up to me, a lot of these people would come up to me and, and be like fans at that point. When I was meeting them, they were already like fans. Cause I was not in the scene as, as I had said. So by the time I actually met, you know, Caraba or Conley or any of these people, they were already fans of my band. And I'm like, guess what? I'm just this little fucking kid who's been around this thing the entire time. I'm not just like some cool guy in a band. I'm literally a band dork. Like I probably sent Fiddler my demo repeatedly. And I think it's the case with a lot of people in bands. It's just that we don't want to admit it quite. Oh, fuck, man. I did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. End it there. <laughs> I love it. I think it's great. So, all right. So two last two questions. One, would, what would you, before I ask the last one, what would you like to plug? Um, well, uh, I would say, even though there's a lot, there's always something going on with me. Um, so, you know, on Instagram, I tend to talk about all those things, you know, whether it's like the songwriting and all blah, blah, blah. But I will say for anyone who's listening to this, who's kind of like just looks at it as one amorphous blob and is like, OK, but what's he doing? Like, I don't really get it. Is anything broken up? Are they not? What is he even doing? Now? But is interested. The main answer is that, you know, I took time off. I focused on writing. And then now I'm, you know, finished recording a record. That is not say anything, and I don't want to say too much about it because I'm like want to try to tantalize people, I guess. Um, and I guess I'm not allowed. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> I guess you're not supposed to. And but it's it's you know it's it's very much the follow up to say anything. And um, so I wouldn't say it's the opposite of it. It is the opposite of it, but very self consciously in the way I do everything. You know the, the sort of post the band project that the singer does that is sort of the opposite of the band. Um, but I'm very aware at all those uh, facets. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and so making the record during uh, COVID and a lot of things that I've been through that I will talk about um, that are pretty epic in the past few years, 
like music did go back to what it was to me when I was writing those first songs in high school, where it became an escape and it was real and there was nothing to do with like worrying about being in a band or it was about that. It was about this. And my kids are, are involved in the project. So I will say that. That's awesome. But it's not lullabies. It's, it's a grown person music for sure. But they're on it. Okay. You're on it. Yeah, you're on it. <laughs> All right, man. Well, last question. Uh, what what scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? Um, well, from this scene, I mean, I think I'm still a, a romantic. You know, I think that that was the thing that, you know, we couldn't escape. You know, otherwise we would have been just straight buddy. We would have been like Buddy Head or we would have, you know, gone and started a band that was like... Exactly what she's saying. Like we would have been in a hipster band, um, but there was, we could never separate ourselves from like just being really sincere and moral, seeing the best in people and being nice. And I think that underneath all the sort of like, whether it's bravado or like angst or punk, it's like very, when I think of the scene, I think of a bunch of like idealistic kids who didn't know what they were getting into. Um, and then you throw in money and you throw in drugs and you throw in all these things and it becomes not just like a kid's birthday party, but it would have been like a children's birthday party if we were all there. And if it had not been for the corrupting influence, like we would all been like, Oh, I love you. Everyone would be just giving each other hugs because everyone's these kind of sweet people who are like marginalized or alienated. And we were like, we want to be nice, but they're not letting us be nice. Oh, be nice. And that's to me what the scene is and that's still vital so it's it's not over you know it's like that's why drake kind of was like oh I, I get this i'm gonna now make this into giant pop music like sad boy music because it's not it isn't as like shitty you don't have to like overanalyze it to the point where it's like misogynistic i don't think you always have to look at being romantic as being um downplaying you know the reality of things or feminism or stuff like that um I think then it should be a nostalgic thing. And it's like, fuck it all. Then this fuck that shit. You know, he, to me, that still applies. So I think being a good person, <laughs> you know, like being a good person, loving my wife, you know, I still love her. I miss her. Like all the things that, that, you know, Matt Pryor would sing about. That's why we still put on the get up kids and a little Corona and it applies. It's not like it's remember when I love my wife, you know, it's like, no, I still fucking love her. Um, so I, I hold on to that sincereness for sure.